Good evening, or the middle of the night for some of our guests here. I am Ariana Cohen Halberstam. I'm the artistic director of Boston Jewish Film. Welcome to our 32nd annual film festival. This is our 10th annual Fresh Flick short film competition, and I think it's one of the best lineups we've ever had. A major thanks to our jury, Caleb Alamani, Bradley Bravender, Goldie Etter, Naomi Fireman, Sarah Gardner, Olivia Grant, Samarjeet Wobble, and Lonnie Wheel. And a special thanks to our program associate, Joey Katz. We spent the entire summer watching short films. Um, all of you uh, met in the middle of the summer to talk about these and came up with this incredible program. So thank you. Those of you who've been to Fresh Licks before know how this works. You will be able to vote for your favorite film by visiting the link at the end of the shorts program. It will also be in the chat. There is a cash prize for the winning filmmaker, so be sure to vote. Winners will be announced on closing night, that's November 15th. And a quick note about a change of program. Unfortunately, Talia Osteen, who's the director of Shabbos Goy, had a family emergency, so won't be joining us today. But it is with real pleasure that I get to introduce these incredibly talented filmmakers who are here with us. Rachel Harrison Gordon, director of Broken Bird. So, Sor Edry and Tom Presman, directors of Tamu, and Mickey Potch and Arkady Kast, directors of Mossel Tov Cocktail. Thank you for being here with us. And um, you know, I, I would I would like to start by just giving a special thank you for those of you who are up in the middle of the night. Um, what time is it in Germany now, uh, Mickey and Arkady? It's one a.m. right now. Yeah. And in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> and in Israel. It's 2 a.m. Um, 2 a.m. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and, and Rachel's joining us from Philadelphia. So, uh, well, if, if, when the questions get hard, we'll direct them to you because it's the middle of the night for other people. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> This is, this is such an interesting lineup of films this year, and um, all of these films deal with identity in a really interesting way. Um, I want to start by asking each of you how you came to make these films and whether there were personal connections to the stories that you tell. Rachel, you're, you're up first because you're, you're spotlighted right now. <laughs> sure. This film is definitely autobiographical about my own experience growing up um, with my mom who's white in a region that's pretty homogenous, um, mostly white, and we were the only, or I was the only black person at my temple. Um, and the story definitely tries to portray the isolation that I felt in my race about not really feeling connected to religion, which I know is a part of a lot of um, young people growing up, but um, I also just didn't feel a connection, like it was written for me. Um, the rules and the texts and I just distanced myself and was treated as a bad Jew, which kind of pushed me away further. And the process of making the film has actually been really cathartic in that it's helped me embrace the sort of duality of my experiences. Um, my parents are divorced and we definitely incorporated both of their stories and they're really generous about letting me borrow some of our memories. And that process was um, helpful in conjuring a lot of conversations about how I felt growing up and um, some of the racial tensions that are re-emerging now, um, just, just allowing more transparency and growth. And that's been really wonderful to see. And it's been great also to see people who don't necessarily look like me or have the same background relating to different aspects of the movie and finding the humor and optimism in it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very relatable film, and um, I'm curious how your you said that this helped you have some conversations with your family. I'm curious at what point you shared the film with your parents and and what their reactions were initially. Oh my gosh, my mom she she took it very literally, and she's like, "Okay, I didn't say this line like this, and this didn't quite happen like that," and was like fact checking the story even though it's fictional. But I think ultimately she. Um, it was my first film and it's the first time that she's seen me kind of um, emote creatively. So I think she was just really happy that I took the risk and left my old data analysis engineering life behind for something that I truly loved and she would hear me talk about, but um, I went for it and she was fun, happy to be with that. She's like, take me as your date to the Oscars. So, you know, she's dreaming big now. 
Um, my dad, though, he um, he is very emotional, but he kind of holds that close to his heart. And it was difficult at first to extract how he was feeling. But I think, you know, the word I used before was cathartic. I think he was really relieved that um, I loved him and that I wanted to include him in this process and celebrate him and how the character does view her father as a hero. And I think he really was relieved about that. And um, we've definitely grown closer in the process of making this movie. And, and I'm now working on the feature and they're both kind of asking to see the script at different stages. My mom is more eager than my dad, but they're both you know excited to see what happens. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear it's becoming a feature. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Um, Tom and Sor, I'm going to turn to you next. Um, this is a film that takes place in Morocco in the last century. Tell me a little bit about how you came to create this, this movie. Hi, I'm Sol. Um, we are both the co-directors and we were worked on the, on the script together as our graduation film. Um, but, and we both uh, have uh, certain experiences as queer people who both live in Israel in a very you know Middle Eastern culture, um, but the film is definitely more informed, I think, by my personal experience um, coming from a Moroccan family and being trans. And it was a form of talking about uh, like it, you don't often hear about the stuff when you talk about Jewish history, especially uh, Jewish history in North Africa. It's mostly about um, ethnic tensions and tensions between whether Jews who arrived here and, um, have intentions with Ashkenazi people or over there tensions with the, with the Muslims. But you don't often in general see a lot of talk about uh, queer Jewish history in diaspora. And it's something that we really felt was missing in our own personal lives as well, talking to our families about their history and how they can relate to our queerness where we are now. So it was kind of like a combining all of these uh, feelings and putting them into, into one story. You start the film with, with a quote um, or with text that says, he said back when a family named a girl Tamu and meant that, that may this be the last girl so that the next child would be a boy. Where is that quote from and and how did you decide to start the film with it? Um, I'll answer that. I'm Tom and we while making the film we didn't have a name for the character we just know it. it's a it's a someone in Morocco and we needed a name, just not to call it like the character, the character. So we were looking into names from a Jewish Moroccan background. And I think it was one of the first names that we came by, uh, Tamu. And like the description was just, that's the description at the beginning of the film. And it's exactly how we felt about that character. It felt like, like magic, I don't know. And it said like the family back then when they call called child uh, Tamu, it will be a girl. And it's because they wanted a boy, the next child, Tamu from Ended in Hebrew. Um, so it really fit in place and really inspired us to, inspired us more to create even more depth to the, to the character because of the name. Um, so that was like really lucky uh, to find that perfect name for our film. It's, it's such an, in, this idea of sort of putting this wish into a name and, and assigning, assigning something to a person with their name is, I mean, names are, are interesting and that's, that's a, a, I, I love that, that text at the beginning. Um, I'm going to ask now um, of you, um, of Masel Tov Cocktail, um, which is a film that deals with many different identities in a way because it deals both with um, identity as, as being a Jew in Germany, but also being a Soviet Jew in Germany. And uh, we, I learned a lot watching the film. Um, I'm curious about your personal ties to the film, uh, both Mickey and Akiba. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna start as I'm the, I'm the Jewish person here and Mickey is not. 
that's why um, also I kind of started the film and it was all about the idea, how can we communicate what it feels like to be Jewish in Germany nowadays? So kind of what experiences you have and what kind of situations you find yourself as a Jewish uh, young boy, young man growing up in Germany. And um, to be honest, in the beginning, we asked ourselves, like, what do Germans actually know about Jews except Hitler, Holocaust, and anti-Semitism? And the answer is not so much, because, like, the basic problem is that uh, Jews in Germany are only talked about in a, inside these associations. So the Germans know the Jews only from the position of the perpetrators, and the Jews are the victims. And uh, yeah, no one knows even in Germany about like the Soviet immigration inside Germany in the early 90s. And um, people are surprised when they meet a Jew, a Jewish person. It's totally different from the States or of course Israel. And um, yeah, it's uh, interesting. And, and Mickey is uh, the co-director and we're making films for several years now. He's not Jewish, but like he has total empathy for the topic as he knows me and uh, kind of that's why we did the film together and it's also it was also interesting to have a like german more german perspective inside the project project yeah. it's it's interesting too you you both um both you and sir had um similar react uh, responses in that you both have um one of you has a closer connection to the material than than your directing partner. Um, and I'm curious about sort of the, the work as a directing partner and how you became a team. I'll start with you, Mickey. How did, how did you guys get to know each other and, and what was the process of making this film together and, and sharing your perspective as on this very Jewish film as someone who isn't Jewish? Yeah, um, we got to know each other before I think 10 years it was um, at our film studies in Cologne and then we formed together a small production company called Freigeist Film. Um, we were four people and then I think we shot four movies or something and um, it was always so that one of us uh, was the assistant of the other one but in fact the assistant he also made like creative choices and we saw that the assistant is somebody who really, yeah, speaks to the actors and uh, does everything what the director does. So uh, the first time we worked on a professional set, we realized, okay, the assistant director, he's more organizing than doing anything um, creative. So uh, then we realized, okay, it's maybe unfair. Let's, let's uh, do like co-direction. And so it's our third movie in co-direction. And um, I think, yeah, Cardi um, worked for two years, like alone on the film. He collected notes uh, about his experience um, with German people wrecked into his Jewish identity. And then he uh, wrote the first draft with his uh, girlfriend, Merle Kirchhoff who also studies uh, history with um, aspect on German history. And I think it was the third version where I came into the process and then we dramatized together the uh, story. And yeah, I think this was the genesis of the project. Akadi, I don't know. Um. Yeah, I think you're, Ariana, you want to yeah. say something? No, go ahead. No, uh, there was nothing to add. It was like uh, oh. cool for me. I mean, it's really interesting, especially in Jewish film festivals or like speaking on stage because the film is made from like a really subject Jewish perspective, right? Uh, there's a Jew talking from the screen to the audience and also like in interviews it's a really kind of also a little bit funny for me like Mickey taking this perspective and also arguing from the Jewish perspective with audience it's kind of funny but it works there's all this this whole debate about like can you make films out of your bubble like not from your like subjective view on things like can you make can you can you make can you have a, a can you have black 
uh, protagonists in a film, POC people, uh, when, you, when you are not POC. And I think kind of, if you do your homework and all the research and you have like, you talk to people and you find out then you actually can do, because like Mickey could do this like whole interview thing also like without me, but I kind of give the, I how you say, um, I- um, Authenticity I in a way. Yeah. What? Authenticity. The authentic authenticity, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, it's an interesting question. I, I'm wondering if anyone else um, here has any perspectives on that, about who's allowed to make films about identity. If, if you want to, if you want to go into that. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, I think uh, you should be allowed to do anything because we should trust other people that it's possible to, uh, to gain knowledge uh, in a professional way about a topic you maybe don't know yet so much, but you can learn. Um, but in fact, if uh, there wasn't for Akadi, I, I uh, wouldn't do it because I would say, okay, that's, I, I can't feel it maybe. So, um, yeah. Maybe we'll get back to this topic if, if uh, is, is Tom, you're muted. Sorry, you can hear me now? Yes. I wanted to, to say that I think that if a person knows how to deal with the subject in a, in a subtle, in a, in a very mature way, um, keeping it, um, well, doing it well, uh, it can be anyone as long as he, he handles it with care. And after a lot of research and knowing the subject up close, yeah, but it can all, always add to come from the background of the subject of the film. It, it gives, like you said, a, a real touch of authenticity to it. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and your films all feel very authentic. Um, I'm, I'm really interested because the forms of all of your films are so different. Um, obviously, Tom and Sir, your film is, is animated so beautifully. And um, Mickey and Arkit, you have these um, over titles coming in and it's very punchy. And Rachel, yours is a very intimate film, um, you know. And so, and I, I would love to hear sort of how you made the films. Uh, and, Tom and Sir, I'm interested in, in whether you're both animators, how the direction works for an animated film, if you can talk a little bit about the design. And particularly, I was really taken with the images. It looked like photo animations on photographs at some point, um, which is, seemed much more intricate. And then there was those really um, simple but moving images of the mouth um, when Tamu waxes their mustache. and and then allows it to grow back. Um, so I, I would love to hear a little bit about your animation process. So <laughs> we both um, co-directed and wrote uh, the story. And when approaching to work on the, the design, the animation, well, um, the, the design of the characters are tours that is a special um, lines and the uh, vision, uh, which I really love. And that's why it was really easy to decide because it's hard when you're two people and we study together and we were in the same department. Uh, it's not very easy or always easy for everyone to just decide, okay, we're gonna do your, your style. Um, but I think we came into this project knowing our, our best sides to the working process and so is truly like in that place is uh, is the master, and I just wanted my film to look in that way. So it was really easy to just okay, we're doing your style, uh, because we, in the end you need to think like what's going to promote the film the best, and it's less about like ego, and you need to know that when you're coming into a partnership about working with films. So I can say that like from the like from the perspective from everything, um, the cinematic voice, we both talked about everything, but like it most came from me and like the designing 
again, we both talked about everything, but it's more of him. So we really combined our strength into that. And we're happy from that, uh, the results from that. And I'll, I'll let Thor talk about more uh, about the, the design. Um, yeah, so the design process itself, it was, it started from a certain style that I work in, in my, like even in my other work, in my illustration work, et cetera. We both study animation in um, a specialization that is usually for stop motion, uh, stop motion and experimental. So for me, it was really about taking those um, techniques and materials that you usually use for stop motion work and for like uh, cutout work and applying the principles of it to 2D animation that is done like on the computer with, it's still drawn by hand, but it's, uh, I wanted to bring that kind of like physical feel to something that is usually a bit more um, not so tactile. So actually a lot of the, we, went, we used a lot of uh, collage in the film, especially in the, in the backgrounds, but also in some of the transition scenes. Like all the pictures are from like my, <laughs> my family album. And <laughs> it, it, was, it kind of like gave it a very intimate feeling for me at least, because there is also, uh, it was also kind of like about resolving my own like family, problems with, with, with that side of the family that didn't quite embrace my identity. So to kind of like insert them into it and to insert myself into it was in this very explicit way was part of the, the plan. Um, and I when it comes... I'll just, sorry, I just wanna add for like, for an example, like his dad went to a, a trip to Morocco and he came back with pictures. And one of those pictures are just, he took a picture of tiles on the floor. And we just said, okay, that's interesting. Let's see. And we played with it. And all of a sudden it was like this magic on the, on the screen. And it's absolutely like the same picture of tiles everywhere in the film, just in different uh, like overlays of work. And it really brought like a simple picture from a family trip his, his dad had to lighten, to bring like a, this Moroccan feel into it, which played really good, I think, in our designing of the film. Yeah, I, I, there's a question actually from the audience and I'm, we're starting to get these and I'm, I'm gonna transition to asking audio, audience questions in a minute, I have a few more, um, but Mark Lowenstein asks a question to the two of you. The color palette in the film was gorgeous and unusual, really evoked the setting. So you talked a little bit about um, the patterns, but can you talk a little bit about the choices of colors? Yeah, definitely. Um, we did want to go with something very graphic and very like kind of like a limited color palette. So everything would like, first of all, so everything would read very clearly because when you're working with complex backgrounds, you don't want and characters with no lines, you don't want your character to disappear somewhere. And like, you have to really think about the contrast of every single thing. And it also worked with this kind of like uh, cinematic feeling that we wanted to evoke of like German expressionism, but make it Moroccan. So everything was very like angled and high contrast and bold shadows, but to do it in, in color in a way that also um, really kind of like shows the, the setting and how the character experiences it. Yeah, it's, uh, you mentioned German Expressionism and you definitely, with the looming shadows, you you definitely get that. Um, I, I hadn't, I definitely hadn't thought German Expressionism would make it at Moroccan. I like that phrasing a lot. Um, Rachel, you, a lot of the fabric of your film comes from music. Uh, we hear Nina Simone singing Eretz Zavat Chalav Vash at the beginning. We hear these, I think to anyone who's been through a bar bat mitzvah, the very familiar cantoral, uh, chanting it, it, that she's listening to at the beginning and then of course uh, the Donna Summer which my entire office was singing after we saw the film for <laughs> weeks. Um, can you talk a little bit about how music played into your film and, and how you chose to texture it? Yeah, yeah I think um, 
before I ever wanted to be a filmmaker, I was always inspired by music. And it was one of the ways that my dad and I would communicate when we didn't quite have words to exchange or their feelings with we use lyrics and would send each other albums and he kind of alerted me to the fact that my parents had this huge collection of records that was like not spoken of by my mom who I think is was in kind of denial of that whole part of her life this like disco party era um, but I really do love how music portrays different worlds that we enter and I love hearing new songs with samples of old songs. I love that connection to the past, the connection to culture, just music definitely says a lot. And when we discovered that Nina Simone song, I thought, well, that was kind of the perfect fit for us of having this black woman that I adore singing about something that um, I just had never really heard those words come out of the mouth of someone who looked like that other than me. And, you know, like I'm, a far cry from Nina Simone when I talk or sing or do anything. So um, I, that was, I was just really grateful that that came into our life. And I also think Land of Milk and Honey symbolizes something, an ideal of something that sounds really beautiful and um, delicious if you can get it to work. And I think that that's kind of what the character is, is yearning for and seeking. So um, I definitely love being able to incorporate all of these different genres. And also, I, I was always very self-conscious of hearing my singing voice and would keep that to myself. Like you mentioned, the film feels very intimate. And I think that um, when I had to go through my bar mitzvah, I was forced to chant or sing <laughs> in front of people. And that was um, in one way very nerve-wracking, but another way very liberating. And so I also liked seeing music as using your literal voice, but um, symbolically just showing she's coming into her own and her individuality. So yeah, it was complicated and getting those rights was, you know, another story, <laughs> but it was all worth it. <laughs> I, you, I mean, it, it's interesting because I think in some ways more than her actual chanting in the Torah, you see her become a woman when she makes the decision that it's time to go into the, where, where she changes her hair. I mean, I think you know, obviously, um, Tamu has a lot of elements of dress that, um, and the way that plays into identity. But your film also just we start with seeing her getting her hair straightened and and end it uh, with you know her beautiful hair and and dancing freely. And there's this, there's a real growth there in terms of her independence and and ownership of of herself. So um, I think that's really beautifully done. Thank you. Uh, there, there are quite a few questions in here, and I, I'm going to start with uh, this one to you, Mickey and Arkady, because um, there are two questions here that both deal with um, film. The, the first, and, and this, you know, we, we just talked about German Expressionism. The question was about your own influences in making the film. Um, sort of, you reference other films, of course, there's the scene where you turn to black and white and, and you sort of talk about the traditional um, Holocaust films that we see come from Germany and sort of Jewish films always being Holocaust films. What are what are some of your inspirations uh, in film? Uh, there's also a comment here that there's Tarantino-esque moments here and there. So, um, yeah. First, uh, I might answer about like um, yeah, what kind of style we wanted and the kind of quotes we did. Um, of course, like first of all, in the beginning, we wanted to produce something entertaining and something really fun to watch. But very often when it comes down to German Jewish cinema, it feels like work, it feels like school, it feels like you have to go through this and you kind of have to, um, you know, you have to speak about some topic which is really like heavy and really, you know. So it's not really common to produce uh, Jewish cinema in Germany, which is also fun to watch, right? Um, and we wanted something where Jews can laugh about it and also Germans can laugh about it. And um, about the Tarantino-esque style, I don't know. I mean, we grew up with Tarantino, but also we grew up with films like uh, Guy Ritchie um, or um, who's- Edgar who's Wright also. Yeah, Edgar Wright. So we, ba we, we basically wanted to, to put a topic which is like serious, 
and we want to come kind of un is there is it the right word uncramp it um make it a, li a little bit more you know engaging and entertaining and uh, yeah i hope i answered yeah i mean there's there i guess the tarantino s part is there's there's a redemptive moment at the end you know or, or a violently know. redemptive moment where he kicks somebody in the, yeah, in the it's, face yeah it's our guilty pleasure and i think it's an uncommon position which is not told at all except in inglorious bastards but like it's the uncommon position of the aggressive jew like it's it's not the position as the jewish victim who is being uh, uh who is being always in the position of being the victim, but it's the other position. It's the position of like a Jew who punches back, who breaks noses, and who is not willing to apologize because someone else is telling him to. And I think it's, we should, we like, the, we, uh, I speak as we the Jews, we need more kind of this, of this role models and idols and uh, yeah. That's, so that's, I think it's, yeah, I think it's interesting throughout the film. He keeps asserting that he's not a violent guy. Yeah. <laughs> so even even he won't own up to that to that identity. Was, uh, interesting. I think it was in another interview. There was an interviewer. He said, OK, there's a difference between Mazatov cocktail and Ingros Bustards. Of course there is. But um, in the violence and in Dima's attitude, because when he first punches Toby in the face uh, in the toilet, uh, he is really shocked and he steps uh, back and you can see it in his face that he is sorry. And um, I think in the last scene where he meets Toby again, you get the feeling that Dima really didn't want to break his nose and that he really is no aggressive guy. But yeah, then it happens and Toby gets so provocative again. That's our hero's journey, you know, we kind of look for <laughs> hero's journey. So we thought, okay, let's make him the aggressive guy in the end. And yeah. Still still asserting he's not aggressive. There's another question for you here while, while we're talking uh, from Darius Russell Kish, uh, who's wondering if you, while you were making the film, you were thinking of prior films like, Daiju I'm going to butcher this, Juden Schlobit. Schlobit. Thank you. German is a, is a difficult language for, for <laughs> those of us who aren't born speaking it. Um, <laughs> that had real educational purposes being shown in German schools. Is there a sim similar, albeit more narrative and confrontational purpose for this film as mass educational tool? So I think that relates to what we were just talking about is sort of you you feel, feel that these sort of Im images of Jews need to be shown more. Um, who do you hope will see the film and, and what do you hope will come out of portraying Jews differently here? Yeah, well, for, fortunately the, the film like we in the beginning we didn't think we're making an educational movie for like schools and pupils we just wanted to produce a movie which is fun and which tells a topic like we want to speak about um but the film is like very very successful in germany right now i mean we're in loads of festivals and we are, had our tv broadcast and also um, there will be a dvd and it will distribute it to different educational organizations and in schools and this is really uh, exciting for us. And I think also it's important because there's a big lack of knowledge in Germany about Jews. And also there's a, uh, of course, there's also anti-Semitic anti problem. Like uh, I think around 20% of Germans have anti-Semitic views, which puts the German Federal Republic in roughly in the middle European field. And, um, of course, it's a collective conscious disease, but uh, films like ours, I hope so. We won't start a movement, but we'll contribute a little bit to uh, the fact that like, like many Germans who nev have, have never met a Jew, they kind of get in touch with it. And maybe one day they meet one, they will kind of approach him or her differently, right? And uh, yeah, but it's it's also like for me personally, it's really um, exciting also to see how the reception is in other countries. And I'm really interested in international perspective, like because when we made it, we always thought, yeah, it will be maybe successful in Germany because it's like such a German Jewish topic, like so many things discussed in the films, they're really like really specific to Germany. And it's interesting to see how it like also works internationally in 
even in Asian countries or like South America, where no Jews at all, I mean, in Asia. And uh, yeah, also in the States, it's really, it's really cool. I'll let you know the reactions we hear from the festival. Um, it's I, it's interesting to sort of make make a film for one audience and with one audience in mind and, and see it take off into another world. Um, so earlier you mentioned that one of the reasons you wanted to make this film is we don't really hear queer stories from the diaspora and particularly um, for places like Morocco. Um, who I'm curious if, if the film has been shown in Moroccan communities perhaps just in Israel um, and what the reaction has been, has it opened up conversations um, perhaps with the family that you mentioned sort of being less willing to sort of um, accept your identity? Well, um, locally it has been shown, it, not to any specific group, just like in, in, in animation festivals and, and like student film festivals. And I don't know if there has been a specific like like Israeli Moroccan reaction to it outside of my own uh, circle. Um, my dad has seen it and he was very touched by it after he saw it like several times and uh, it kind of got through to him. Like he, he has been speaking to me ever since about like how it kind of made him realize what I had gone through during the time that we, he, we weren't really in touch. Um, but what I, will say is that uh, to when I have shown this film to friends like across the, the Arab world or who are in uh, diaspora in Europe who but are from like uh, the Middle East or um, or even like uh, other like queer Palestinian friends of mine it, they all like immediately got it and were very like they could really relate to it and could, were really touched by it uh, in a way that kind of like it it is I think kind of like a, a very like it's not a very self-explanatory film it's a film that you kind of need to understand uh, several layers of meaning uh, of different like identities and concepts to really kind of like get it on a first watch and I do think that it really worked because if, even when we were developing it, we, we said that uh, this is a film for a specific audience and everybody is welcome to watch it. Everybody is welcome to find their own place to connect to it, but uh, that we weren't uh, willing to compromise on making it uh, too generic or too like uh, educational or too like explaining about what is this identity? What is that identity? We, I, I really wanted to make it a uh, kind of like how a person from that history would experience it rather than like how an outsider would view it. Did you do historical research? Oh yeah, we, we, did, we did quite a lot uh, actually, both like um, on our own and we did get the help of a, of a researcher, uh, an American, um, researcher who whose work is on like uh, North African uh, Jewish history. Uh, his name is Noam Siena and he gave us a lot of information especially with regards to the, the he actually uh, put up a book I think last year or the year before about like queer Jewish history. It's called uh, A Rainbow Thread if anybody wants to hear it it's a great resource. Um, and with his help and the help of other like researchers in the field, we really kind of like scrounged up every like little bit of information that we could, even though a lot of it is obviously not something that's been recorded or something that was very sparsely recorded in like police reports or like a scandalous um, newspaper bits. But yeah, we we did a lot of historical research and also contemporary research like we I, we spoke to um, people uh, in Morocco today like a lot of artists and LGBT people in Morocco or like over Instagram like <laughs> trying to to really kind of find that um, common thread to make it really to make sure that it's really 
as as a universal and a personal story as we could. It's just interesting. Be oh, go ahead. Sorry. Quickly add just about like perception in the more um, international point of view, like Arkady said before. I think we when we finished the film, we didn't really know what the reception is going to be, especially like, I think we thought that in countries where um, queer uh, subjects in films are more um, known, it's, it's more, it happens more like in the United States or in more of West Europe. And I think in, in the end, we, we understood that it, it's more popular uh, in countries with uh, like, especially in Russia and Hungary and Poland, I can say that, festivals are really liking it. And I feel that's a very interesting and exciting uh, fact, seeing that right now LGBT uh, communities are threatened in those countries and it's like less easy to be yourself there. So I think this is really an, a great thing that came out of this, just seeing where the film goes and understanding where the, the talk and the conversation is very, uh, people are eager to talk about that subject. It's amazing. And it really, as you said, is a film that, you know, on second viewing, I, I feel like I got even more out of it. And because because it's so um, rich in color and in tone, I think it almost, the, the first time I watched it, I almost let it wash over me because it was just beautiful. Um, and then was able to sort of go back in and, and really dive into the character of Tamu. So, um, if anyone's able to take a second look at it, I would I would recommend watching it again even. Um, so Rachel, you mentioned you're doing a feature now and I'm curious how the process, I know that your film played in, in several festivals in the spring and I'm curious about the reception and sort of how you came to make it into a feature and, and how similar to the short it's going to be. Sure, actually, it's really great to be on this panel because one of the festivals we got to go to was Berlin and I went with my partner who is Israeli. So I felt like it was just a combination of all these worlds that in a way we're trying to incorporate and the reception, I was hesitant because it feels to me like a very American story. American bar and bat mitzvahs are very in my opinion, they're a little superficial. They're kind of gravitate more to the party aspect. And a lot of the kids don't really know what the texts even say. And um, that was part of the way reason I felt disconnected to it. But um, a lot of the questions we got from the audience who in some instances were middle school age, the same age that the characters were going through, they had very similar experiences. And I thought that that was really reassuring that um, that Pro, that coming of age process was relatable. I think there's something really magical in making something feel as specific as possible that makes it universal, kind of what um, the Tamu group was just talking about a little bit. Um, but one of my hesitations about making the short was that I felt like I had to stick to one character and kind of eliminate all of the background of both of the parents and specifically the father, which um, I was super protective about him since it's based on a true story, but also just protecting the figure of a black person in media, not fulfilling their promises, um, someone struggling with addiction. I didn't want to mistreat that. Um, so the feature I think allows us to really explore that in more depth. The structure is kind of a parallel story between the father and daughter and you see how similar they are and how many missed connections there are and that they really do need each other in their life. And even if they don't physically make that connection, they kind of conjure each other's spirit when they need to. So I'm really excited for it to come together. Last night I stayed up late cutting out like all these little scene cards and taping them to my wall. Just, you know, I needed a distraction. It's a little crazy over here in the US. Um, so I, I got to focus on the story, which was nice and hopefully um, say what the short couldn't say um, and, and expand the audience a little bit more too. So when, when do you start, do you have plans to start shooting or has that all been delayed because of uh, COVID or um, how, how, has, how has this in the summer? I mean, I'd love to film in the summer. That's just, I throw that out there and I'll have fate blow that in the wind and see what actually happens. But 
I, I miss being on set. I miss being around people, period, but just being really creative and making decisions quickly and picking out outfits and um, something that was actually really fun about doing the set design is, I guess I'm a little bit of a hoarder. So a lot of those photographs actually um, and other items were from my room, these artifacts that I had collected from experiences of being with my black side of my family or um, just just trinkets that I, I felt symbolized my identity, but were like hidden in my room. And so it was really nice to uh, celebrate the origin of those stories by just placing them in the corner of the frame. And, you know, if people notice, which some people did and they'd ask questions and follow up, but if they didn't, then it was like my little secret. <laughs> I love that there are photographs um, in both your film and in Tamu from personal yeah. histories. Um, so I, I guess before we, we wrap up, well, first there's a question about where Maseltov cocktail takes place, what city it's in, and if, and if there's a difference in the way, um, if, if this experience would be different in different in big or small cities in Germany. Okay. Um, the film was shot near Stuttgart. It's in South, oh. South uh, West Germany. But in fact, we wanted to illustrate another area, the Ruhrpott, it's called. Um, it's uh, famous for its industry. In the last years, it's a bit in um, decay. Um, so it's a bit... Uh, yeah, it's a little bit uh, like in the States, like what is it called? The Rust Belt? Uh, yeah. yeah, this is like the industrial zone of Germany. And this is the this is the this is the place where I grew up and where I'm from, and it's visually like interesting because it's like super edgy and um, kind of yeah. And I think the experience would be very similar in all places, except I would say like, of course, when you are from a city like Berlin or Frankfurt with a big Jewish community, then it's maybe different growing up there because like, for example, me being the only Jewish guy in my school being the only Jewish guy in like different like clubs, na na na, only Jewish guy in friend circle. When you're in Berlin or when you're Frankfurt with a bigger Jewish community, then it's of course completely different, yeah. Um, but uh, I think, I mean, there are in, in a country with 84 million people in Germany, there are around 200,000 Jews. So not many Germans have met Jews even when they're from Berlin or Frankfurt. Yeah, I think it, I was the first Jew I got to know. Yeah. <laughs> and now you're meeting many at Jewish film festivals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are you guys working on next? Uh, us? Yes. Uh, we're, we're planning to do a feature, like everyone is planning to do a feature. And uh, no one knows we'll do it one day, but we hope so. So we kind of went in the writing process. So during uh, Corona, COVID, uh, it's good that all festivals are online and we are kind of can get to work. Are you, are you working on the next film together as well? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, we are uh, really in the same flat, but everybody's in his room. Um, <laughs> everybody has its own desktop. Uh, we move together, move together in April to write together the new script. Great. Well, there's there's no feedback, which is impressive when you're in the same space. So, yeah, no, we're in different good walls. Rooms. He's in the living room. I'm in my in my room. Yeah. Um, and Tom and Sir, are you planning to work on another project together, or, or where where are you headed next? We're we're already working on a, a new short animation film, and now we also started to work on a on the side for another one because we're right now we're waiting for just the funds we want a grant for the new short but because of all the situation covid and government stuff so the everything is on hold uh, like funds so we're just keeping on developing the new film which is exciting it's a it's gonna incorporate everything we love and interesting about interested about it's um it's basically about a, a jewish immigrant from algeria who moves to Paris to open the second uh, ever gay uh, bar in the early 19, uh, 20, like the, 
1906. That was the year when he opened it. And it's about that. And it's got everything we love about it. And we're excited to keep working Will on it. Will it be a similar animation style as, as Tamu? So we're building it right now, just trying to think how it's going to look. It, ha it will have a similar aspects to it that we love, like the like we said, the expressionism that we really love. And yes, it's going to be like bright colors, strong colors, and it's going to be cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to see all these projects. Uh, there's one. There's one last question that I'll that I'll ask from our audience um, to Mickey and Arkady um, about the scene of dancing on the Holocaust Memorial. Um, and there was this project, probably two years ago, the Yola Cost project, Y O L O, um, by Shahik Shapira, um, about the way people were interacting with these memorials. Or I think in Berlin. Um, was this an influence for you? Is that where you came up with that scene? And were there other yeah. scenes that were drawn from uh, from media? Yeah, I tried to answer Nick Block in chat, but I, I kind of messed up. But I will, I will just speak to Nick Block for like this. Uh, so <laughs> um, the interesting thing is about, yeah, I know the project by Shark Shapira, but it's like, it's, it's totally common in Germany because like you have memorial sites in every, bigger city and even like in small cities everywhere you go there are memorials there and they are most of times they're in city centers there where the old synagogues used to be before the pogroms in Germany before the pogrom in November so next to our film school like 100 meters away there is the place where the synagogue used to be till 1938 and there is a memorial in kind of the synagogue is, is burned down, but there's this memorial, there are a lot of suitcases standing there and names of people, iron suitcases. And uh, one day I came, I came from school and I saw people playing um, Pokemon Go in, inside the memorial. You know the game Pokemon, where you are kind of collecting the Pokemons? So like people are standing around, they were catching these Pokemons inside this memorial and kind of looking for this uh, Pokemons uh, behind the suitcases. So in the first draft of the script, it was a Pokemon Go scene, but it wasn't, of course, not so uh, cin cinematic. And um, <laughs> that's why we changed it to the dancing girls. But yeah, also Shark Shapira, like he did it, he did this thing about the Berlin Memorial, which is huge. And every time you go there, you see people like taking a sun bath or playing hide and seek inside the memorial. So it's uh, kind of, no, it wasn't because of Shark Shapira and because of the Holocaust project. It was just because like, it's a common thing in Germany to watch these things happening. Yeah, yeah maybe uh, I think also Nick asked if there were other influences. Uh, I think another influence was also Max Scholleck. He's a Jewish intellectual who wrote a book called, I don't know if, if it's in English, if there's a version, it's in German, it's disintegriert euch. You could translate it uh, like disintegrate yourself. Um, it's a bit about um, that the Jews don't have to integrate into the German culture and throw away all their yeah, cultural identity, but to keep it and don't um, yeah, play the roles the Germans want them to play. We see so many of those different roles for, sort of explored through your film. Um, I know many of you are uh, ready to go to sleep and, or go back to checking the news, I'm sure. So I, I want to thank you so much, um, Sur, Mickey, Arkady, Tom, and Rachel for being with us tonight and for sharing your films with us. Everyone in the audience, uh, be sure to vote for your favorite film. Tell your friends to watch these films. They'll be available until November 15th. Um, and join us on Sunday for another short film panel. Uh, we have a short film program called Where Do We Go From Here? And that panel will be at 4 p.m. on Sunday. So thank you all, good night. And I look forward to staying in touch and seeing your next projects. Good night, good night. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs> bye. Good talking with Bye. you.